Welcome to Rewind Sunday, a podcast replay of the Sunday morning message from Watermark Church Ashford. Good morning, church. As always, it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you guys, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And we get to meet in this beautiful building. Uh, We really are blessed people. We are. Um, I'm thankful for Pastor Todd for trusting me to to lead and to share God's Word this morning. And I'm certainly planning on sharing God's Word with very much fear and trembling this morning. Now, I don't take lightly this opportunity, and I've been praying about this message. As some of you may know, I'm currently working on a degree at Liberty University in Christian apologetics. Now, for those of you who may not know what that is, uh, apologetics is being equipped to make a defense for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ as we are commanded to do so in 1 Peter 3.15 and many other passages throughout the Bible. Furthermore... I'm the student and the college pastor here at Watermark, and I have the privilege of teaming up with you guys to disciple the next generation of faithful Christ followers, grade six through college. Make no mistake, though, while that group may be the next generation, if they're bought by the blood of Jesus, if they're following Christ, they're the church of today. They're not the church of tomorrow. But to get to the point, Within those ministries, and as I go about the daily ministry of life, there are some questions about God, about Jesus, and about the Bible that I get more than others, that I'm asked more than others. Genuine questions. Questions that you and I should be equipped to answer on the spot. And I plan to evaluate a few of those questions today. Let's pray first for the Holy Spirit to guide us and to illuminate God's word. Dear God, I pray that as we read your word, as we study your word, that your spirit will open up our eyes and open up our hearts to receive it and to understand it. We thank you for all that you do, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me begin by sharing with you a phenomenon from back in the 90s. Now, some of you will remember this if you were born before 1990, but for many of you, this is going to be a largely unfamiliar concept. So back in the day, as it were, people would work all week just like they do today. And of course, just like we do today, we work hard all week in anticipation of payday. The only difference is back then, we would get back to the shop. I was in construction back then, so I would get back to the shop. I would go in the office, and I would pick up my paycheck. Now, I'm talking about a real paper paycheck, not just going in there and getting a check stub that says some money had been deposited into my account, but an actual paper check that I would have to take to the bank. I would have to present my driver's license, and they would cash that check, and they would count out these crisp, new-looking bills to me. And, man, that was such a good feeling to finally make it to payday. Late in the 1990s, however, with computers really booming and technology becoming more and more available and more prevalent among society, we seen counterfeit money begin to emerge at greater rates than we ever had before. So then, and they still do this today, When you go into a store and you try to pay with a bigger bill, they'll take that little marker and they'll mark it. And then they'll hold that thing up to the light and they'll make sure that it has all the identifying markers of an authentic bill. They wanted to make sure that you're not some scammer coming in trying to pass off fake bills. Now, I have to admit, at first I would get offended when they would do this. Like, how dare you question the authenticity of my money? But then I developed this irrational fear. I was scared that the bank unknowingly may give me a counterfeit bill. And then I would go into a store, not knowing it, and I would pass that counterfeit bill off and get caught. Now, I was a pretty rough looking dude back then. Nobody would have believed that it was an accident. They would have carried me straight to jail. So I would compare these bills 
I would get him and I would look at him and I would compare him to the best of my ability to be sure that they were authentic. And I remember they used to have these old bills and then they switched to these new bills with these big faces on them and stuff. And I used to hate it when I would get an old one because the old ones look fake. But that, that's a story for another day. But, but I would always study. And now, luckily to my knowledge, I never received and therefore I never passed off a fake bill. Praise God for that. But it is interesting, and I've thought about this, to know how the federal government trains to identify fake money. You would think that they would spend countless hours and resources studying the equipment used to make the counterfeits and then getting as many counterfeits as they could, getting them together and studying all the nuances and the discrepancies in those bills. That way they could pick up on the patterns and it would make it very easy to spot the fakes. But this is not the strategy that the feds use at all. They study the real money in order to spot the fakes. The feel, the look, the sound it makes, the way that it smells. They study everything about the real thing so closely that they can spot a fake a mile away. Similarly, in our Western culture, we're often presented with a counterfeit Jesus. It's important to know that it is, it is accepted by all serious historians, almost unanimously, that Jesus lived as a human on this earth. Almost all of them acknowledge that. Most of them, including PhDs and medical doctors and scientists and historians, agree that Jesus died on the cross, that he went there and that his injuries would have taken his life. It's almost universally agreed upon and accepted. Most historians will also confirm that history attests to the fact that that tomb was empty three days later when they went and checked it. These are all things that are almost universally accepted by historians. But the world is convinced that Jesus is not and that he never claimed to be God. And if he's not God, then he has no power to save. And I know that most people within the Christian community, they scoff at this idea. How dare they say that? But with our lives, oftentimes, this is exactly what we're saying. Furthermore, our pride tries to convince us that we're not that bad. And since Good deeds, all the good deeds you have done outweigh the bad, surely that's enough to get you into heaven. Therefore, sin is the problem of all the bad people in the world and it's not my problem. And out of this idea of inherent good comes this inclusive agenda that hides behind a veneer of love saying that you can be who you want and that you can do what you want and you're free to follow your heart and that we should accept everyone and all of their ideas because that's what Jesus would do. And I'm sympathetic to those of you in here who are wrestling with doubt. You have experienced hurt and evil and heartache on this earth and you have trouble harmonizing the suffering that you have endured with the truth that God is good. And much of the world says that even if Jesus is real, even if Jesus is God, I still don't want anything to do with him because of the evil that he allows in this world. He obviously doesn't care about my pain. These ideas are not the products of a biblical Christian worldview. And they do not tell the truth about Jesus. Now, for those of you who don't fully understand or are not familiar 
yet with what a worldview is. A worldview is a lens or a framework that we use to interpret the world and answer all of life's most important questions. And the Lord gave us his framework when he gave us the Bible. Many of our children's, if not our own worldviews, are being corrupted by this burden of information that we have at our fingertips. And these counterfeits that are presented there are packaged so cleverly and they are so aesthetically appealing that often at first glance, they don't even appear to be dangerous. So when interpreting what is real, as a Christian, in order to avoid these aforementioned counterfeits, we must look at the world through the lens of the Bible so that we can tell the real from the counterfeit. A biblical worldview has five pillars, but because of time, we're going to look at three of them, and then we're going to look at the Gospel of John, and we're going to see the authentic Jesus. The first pillar is creation. In the beginning, God created everything. We did not come from some big bang and humans are not the product of evolution. That notion is ridiculous and it takes more faith to believe that humans come from evolution than it does to believe that in the beginning, God. The world says evolution is science but I've taken science classes, I just took a biology class, and no, evolution is not science, it is more philosophy or religion than science. Because with science, you form a hypothesis, you get your constants, you get your variables, you take them in a lab, you do experiments, and at the other end of that experiment, you come out with concrete evidence. With evolution, Darwin began by saying that this is true, and then he done scientific gymnastics to try to prove it, and even today, there's no evidence to prove evolution. There's no fossil record to prove evolution. So I say that it takes faith to believe in evolution, and I believe it actually takes more faith to believe in evolution, to believe that everything accidentally came from this cosmic soup than it does to believe that everything was created from an all-powerful, on-purpose, holy God that created humanity in his own image. And it's plural, by the way, pointing to the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Genesis 127 says, now let us create man in our, our, our own image. Got tongue-tied there. The second pillar of a biblical Christian worldview that I wanna look at this morning is the fall. In Genesis three in the garden, man rebelled against God. And as a result of that rebellion, sin entered into the world. And every person that is born is bent towards sin. And we see this played out from a very young age. Parents, you can testify with me on this. Even before my youngest son, Jet, could walk, he would just be crawling around messing with stuff. And I would say, no, don't touch that. And he would get this really gangster look in his eyes. And he would look me straight in my eyes and he would go, boop. <laughs> I don't care how cute your baby is. By the time he's two, he's a rebel and he's a sinner. And this is important for people who are wrestling with doubt and unbelief in God and the fact that he's good because of the suffering and the evil in the world. A biblical worldview shows us that God created everything and that it was good, but because of sin is why there's so much death, pain, and sickness. Every tear you've ever cried is because we live in a fallen world. Everything that you struggle with, all your anxiety, everything you hate about yourself, all of your fear, all of your doubt, and even the reason that we get wrinkly and our hair turns gray is because we live in a Genesis 3 fallen world. And that world is under 
the curse of sin and corruption and death. Pillar number three, it's redemption. Redemption is God doing something for us that we could never do for ourselves. We see this through the covenants with Abraham and Israel and David in the Old Testament. And then in the New Testament, there's a new covenant where God promises to pour out his spirit on our hearts and to give us new hearts and to write his word on our hearts. And these covenants, they all factor in and culminate with Jesus Christ because he's the one that bought us back. He's the one that redeemed us from the sting of death, the effects of corruption, and from the grip of sin. And not just humanity, all of creation groans in anticipation to the redemption that is brought forth only by Jesus and his blood shed on the cross. So that's my introduction. And before we jump into the scriptures, I want to remind you what we're doing here today, what we're doing here this morning. We're not here to be entertained. We're not. We are here to worship God. And we're here to be equipped for the work of the ministry. And also, I know that there's some of you in here who don't have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. And you're here for a purpose too. You're here to hear the gospel proclaimed. As we pray for God to change your heart and to save your life. So before we continue, let us pray for that. Dear God, I pray that you pour out your love on the lives of those who are lost in here this morning. I pray that anyone in here who doesn't have a saving relationship with you, that you draw them to yourself, God. That you do for them what they can't do for themselves and you pick them up and you turn them around that they may walk in your ways and that they may have eternal life through your son, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray, amen. Now I want us to turn together to the Gospel of John. Whatever copy of the Bible you have, whether it be digital, paper, if you just follow along on the screen, we're gonna be in John chapter one. In this Gospel, John emphasizes Jesus as the divine Messiah, God incarnate dwelling among us. But at the same time, John John wants to lead us into a personal and intimate relationship with Jesus, not only when we get to heaven, but while we live here on this earth. So while the world continues to create a Jesus in their own image, We're going to see how the gospel of John points us to the real Jesus while upholding and reinforcing all of the biblical worldview pillars that we talked about in the introduction. Are you ready? All right, let's go. John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and life was the light of men. Jesus asked his disciples in the book of Matthew, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And that's our first point. Now to be clear, what you believe about Jesus has absolutely no power to change who Jesus really is. But what you believe about Jesus has all the power in the world to transform who you are. For the name of Jesus is exalted high above every other name because it's the only name that can bring dead things back to life. Jesus is the only name in heaven and on earth that can take a wretched rebel like me and like you, wash us in his blood, and present us holy and clean before our Father in heaven. Islam considers Jesus to be a great prophet, but not God. Judaism, or Jews, consider Jesus to be a good teacher at best, and a false prophet at worst, but certainly not God. Jehovah Witnesses believe that Jesus is a created being, deny the Trinity and think therefore he should not be worshiped. Mormons 
believe that Jesus has not always been God, but because of all the good works that he done while he was on the earth, he became God. And if we work hard enough, so can we. Secularists, such as atheists and agnostics, they have various opinions about Jesus, ranging from he's a made up figure, or he's a great teacher who promotes inclusivity, or he's just another man who isn't and never claimed to be God. And while no true born again Christian can or would deny that Jesus is God, many embrace him as savior without ever surrendering to him as Lord. And I suspect that if many Christians held a truly biblical worldview about who Jesus really is, our lives and our witness would have so much more meaning and so much more power the beloved disciple of Jesus confesses that Jesus is God. And this passage has a very interesting parallel back to Genesis 1. This says, in the beginning was the word. Genesis 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was form and void and darkness hovered over the face of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. John places Jesus there at this very moment at the creation of all things with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And I know some people might say, and I've had a combative teenager before, look at me in my eyes and say, well, this says that in the beginning was the Word. They don't say anything about in the beginning was Jesus. Let me direct your attention to verse 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and you have seen His glory, the glory is of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth. It is clear that John, the beloved disciple of Jesus, believed that Jesus is God, and that He has existed with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit for all of eternity, and that everything that was created was created through him and for him, and nothing was created without him. Peter in Matthew 16, when Jesus asked, who do you say that I am, Peter? Peter said, you're the son of the living God, which is to declare that Jesus is God. Even Thomas, who we remember as the doubter because of one of his, the worst moments of his life, which I think a case could be made to call him and remember him as Thomas the Courageous, courageous because there's a passage later we're gonna look at where Jesus says, let's go back to where they just tried to kill me and Thomas says, let us go die with him. But that's a sermon for another day. But even him in John chapter 20, verse 28, he says, Jesus is his Lord and his God. In reality, church history affirms that all of Jesus' disciples believed that he was God. And if he is God, he can't be a created being because God is transcendent, meaning that he exists above, beyond, and outside of his creation. And he's eternal meaning that he has no beginning and he has no end. You see, church, all of these other religions, they acknowledge Jesus. That's what's unique. Every religion acknowledges Jesus. But how could they not? Jesus' birth completely split the calendar. It split the way that we keep time. The world is divided up into B.C., which means before Christ, and A.D., which means Anno Domini, the year of the Lord. So when anybody writes on their check or says 2024, they're acknowledging the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Everybody in the world. Furthermore, every disciple acknowledged that Jesus was God and all but one disciple died for that confession. All of them. The only one who didn't die for that confession was John, the beloved, who wrote this gospel. And for him not renouncing his confession of Jesus being God and Jesus in the resurrection, he was just thrown into a pot of boiling water and exiled to the island of Patmos where he wrote the book of Revelation. 
Jesus himself claimed to be God. And that is an argument you'll see. You'll hear, they'll say, Jesus never claimed to be God. I've been struck with that argument. But remember when the Pharisees tried to stone him for it? Turn with me to John chapter 10. And we'll start in verse 30. Jesus says, I and the Father are one. Then the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered, It's not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. He said, He and the Father are one. And at least seven other times in the book of John, Jesus not only claims to be God, but he also confirms his eternality with what theologians call the great I am statements. In John 8, 58, Jesus says to the Pharisees, before Abraham was, I am. Abraham lived more than 2,000 years before Jesus walked the earth. Yet Jesus is claiming to have existed long before Abraham. In John 6, 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life, meaning he's the only source of eternal life. In John 8, 12, I am the light of the world, and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness. John 10, 7, I am the door that leads to salvation. John 10, 11, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. My sheep know my voice. John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Though you die, I can give you new life. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, which we'll look at more in depth in just a second. And then in John 15, 1 through 5, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and you can do nothing without me. A biblical worldview affirms that Jesus is God as the second person of the Holy Trinity, equal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, united with them in in purpose, but distinct in personhood. And that he has existed for all of eternity and he will never cease to exist. Everything was created through him and for him and is held together by him. The second point to answer a question that I often get Jesus makes a very exclusive statement. The world paints this picture of an all-inclusive Jesus. But in John 14, 6, Jesus makes a very exclusive statement. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Bear with me for a second as I make this point. Compared to Adolf Hitler... I guess we could all say that we're pretty good according to our actions. I'm pretty sure that none of us has committed genocide, right? What about your thoughts? Do you remember Jesus equated being angry with your brother with committing murder? He he equated having a wandering eye with committing adultery. The Bible teaches that there's no man that's good, no, not one. And to be clear, there's no room for subjective morality within a biblical worldview. And our standard of goodness is absolutely not Adolf Hitler. Our standard for goodness and absolute morality is Jesus Christ. We can't meet that standard on our own, meaning we cannot work our way into heaven by our good deeds. But Jesus lived the sinless life that is required of us that we couldn't live for ourselves because we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And for that reason, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him, in Jesus, we may become the righteousness of God. We may meet that righteous requirement. Guys, the enemy tries to deceive us and he tries to deceive our children into believing that we are good and that our good deeds can get us to heaven. Because we think that at the end of the day, surely God will weigh our good deeds against our bad deeds in his cosmic scale and we should come out all right. 
But church, we're all sinners. Remember Genesis 3? Adam sinned against God. And in Romans 12, Paul says, by one man sin entered the world and death with it and we all died. Therefore death has passed over us all because we all have sinned. If people keep believing the lie that sin is someone else's problem, then Jesus is always gonna be someone else's savior. And from this deception, it's bred this counterfeit, inclusive image of Jesus with a facade of love. But behind this phony exterior is a direct attack on the institutions that are set forth in the Bible by God. And that's the institution of marriage and the family, the institution of government and the institution of the church. And at the heart of this movement to destroy those institutions is delusion and evil, not love. Slogans like pro-choice lure us with this facade of having the freedom to choose, but at its core, it's murder. But we redefine the terms in an effort to erase the sin. Even religious leaders of the day say that all paths basically lead to God. Choose which path you want to follow. And these same people, while saying this, try to put God's banner on their baloney. But the real Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father. No one enters heaven. No one has eternal life and, and paradise except through me. The is a definite article. It is used in context to refer to something that is unique or exclusive. It don't mean one of a few, but one and only one. The world and other religions offer many counterfeits. However, the Bible confirms that Jesus is the only way to heaven. He is the absolute truth. He is absolute goodness and salvation and eternal life are found nowhere else and made available in no one else. And if we were good, and if it was good enough for our good to outweigh our bad, I know mine surely doesn't, then sin would always be someone else's problem, always making Jesus someone else's savior because he came to pay the price for sin. The last thing I wanna talk about this morning, and I know that everybody in this room has dealt with this at some point in their Christian walk. I know it, and it's the problem of evil. And this is something that young people ask me all the time. If God is real, and God is supposedly good, then why is there so much evil in the world? And this is not a new question, right? The question of God's goodness. Let me take you back to Genesis. God gave us everything in the beginning. He put everything at our disposal and he ultimately gave our first ancestors one command and that was to trust in him and his knowledge and his goodness. But in the Garden of Eden, there was this tree. And the fruit of this tree had the power to open their eyes to what was evil. And now you may ask, why was this tree in the garden in the first place? It's a good question. Well, God created us to worship him. And according to the Bible, our true spiritual worship is obedience. And God didn't create us to be robots. So in order for us to truly obey, there had to be the possibility to not obey. Thus the tree, thus the choice. Satan enters the picture at this point and he causes the couple to question God's goodness by getting them to question God's word. Did God really say? And this led them to seize autonomy for themselves, eat of the tree, their eyes were open, sin, corruption, and death ensued and entered the world. But church, Jesus grieves with us over the evil in this world. In John eleven thirty five, 35, we see one example of this. Remember earlier when the Pharisees said, we charge you for blasphemy, we're gonna stone you. When that happened, Jesus fled across the Jordan. Him and his followers fled across the Jordan River. And then Mary and Martha sent message to him, sent word to him that Lazarus, the one who he loves, is sick. Now, Jesus is all-knowing, so he knew that Lazarus was gonna die. He knew that he was gonna bring him back to life. But the first passage that every teenager wants to memorize, Jesus wept. If Jesus knew that he died, and Jesus knew that he was gonna bring him back to life, why was Jesus weeping? 
Jesus weeps with Mary and Martha because he sympathizes with their pain and he sympathizes with our pain. And he also weeps because he knows that even after he does these miracles, that many of these people watching are still not gonna believe in him. Some of them are even gonna strengthen their resolve to murder him. Jesus grieves over the lost. He does not desire for any to perish. But 2 Peter 3, 9 says that the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now in this passage, scoffers are mocking Peter, saying Jesus is being slow to fulfill his promise to return. They're probably looking at Jesus and saying, hey, yo, where's he at? He ain't coming back. And Peter says, no, no, you don't understand. Jesus is being patient with you guys that are lost because when he comes back, it's gonna be too late for you. The time for you to repent and live will be over. You will be destroyed in your unbelief. Jesus don't want that for you. His arms are stretched open wide to gather you, but you won't come. Church, we're living in the age of redemption right now. None of us know the day or the hour that Jesus is coming back, but we do know that today we're closer than we were yesterday. In fact, we know that we're closer than we've ever been. So if you believe that Jesus died for you and that he was resurrected three days later and you haven't already, turn to him. Commit your life to follow him. And if you already are following him, knowing that the end is near and it's nearer than it's ever been, This should lead you to live with more purpose. You should be intentional to walk in a manner that's worthy of your calling. You should be a disciple that is out in the world making disciples. Don't just come to be entertained. Come to be equipped and to be refreshed and worship. Fill your cup so that you can go out into the world and do ministry in the overflow of Jesus' love and not working from an empty tank. As we close, let me just reiterate for for one second. The questions I'm, I'm, I'm talking about this morning, they're not just random. Is Jesus really God? Yes, he is. These seem like simple questions, but so many people struggle with them. I've done a survey at the school last year. 67 people took the survey. 57 of them didn't know if Jesus was God or not. Do all religions lead to the same God? No, Jesus is the only way, the only one who leads to God. I'm a good person, will that get me into heaven? No, even your best deeds are like filthy rags. And if God is real and God is good, why is there evil in this world? Because we're sinful, fallen, and separated from the God that created us good in his own image. These are the most common questions or doubt-causing arguments that I hear from non-believers, especially our kids, y'all's kids, especially our kids. TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, all full of posts promoting counterfeit gospels and these false images of Jesus. So if we're not intentional about discipling our children, social media is gonna do it for us. 1 Peter 3.15 warns us, be prepared to make a defense for the hope that is in us. Church, we better know how to answer these questions confidently and our children better know how to answer these questions. It is comforting to know that we don't have to study all the counterfeits out there to spot the fakes. We just need to study the real thing. Church, abide in the love of Jesus, the real Jesus. Those of you who are lost, believe in Jesus and repent for the day of the Lord is near. For his children, it will be a day to rejoice. But for the lost, it will be a day of storm clouds and it will be a time of judgment for the nations. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you're so good. You created the heavens and the earth, the entire universe, but you still seem fit to be active and present in our lives, providing for us, loving us, saving us, 
God, I pray that you'd forgive us for where we fail you, for where we come up short, God. If there's anybody in this room who doesn't know your son, who doesn't know Jesus, God, I pray that you'll draw them to you. I pray that you'll change their hearts. I pray that you'll give them new life that can only be found in Jesus. And God, please, if it be your will, do it today, even right now, because we don't know the hour or the day that he's coming back. We thank you for all that you do. We thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name that we pray.